So, Solo wrote to me. Solo writes, I've been scouring the web for insights into this MSc, referring to the Applied Neuroscience MSc and or the Psychology and Neuroscience of Mental Health MSc at King's College London Distance Learning. Would you be able to give your take on this as I look to start the next year but are concerned with the lack of analysis slash statistics that are being taught, as well as how it portends to career switches? Thanks for your time. So, portends, what the hell does that mean? Let me Google that. Listen, I know I have a posh boy British accent, but I'm not very good with the vocab. Portend, to serve as an omen or warning of presage. Sorry, warning of semicolon, presage. To indicate by prediction, semicolon, forecast. Okay. So the questions are the lack of statistical analysis in the module handbook, I guess, concerns solar. So is it being taught? How well is it being taught? What do we talk on, about on that subject? That's one question. The other question is how well does this degree uh, allow for a career switch? So first question, they don't really teach statistical analysis. I'll tell you why. Well, I'm not going to tell you why because I don't know, but I'm going to tell you why I agree. Because the first four modules are the foundation modules. Those are the four I've completed. The next four are the advanced modules. So these first eight modules are like scientific modules. The last four are where you're going to need statistical analysis. That's your synoptic project and your research projects and whatever, where they basically teach you how to write a scientific study and how to understand one, how to write a review. I mean, the whole degree is about how to understand scientific studies, but it's more about, or sorry, the first four modules are more about extracting the information and looking at the sample site. Well, they never really talk about that either. They just want you to get the scientific insights to understand the science from the papers without worrying about the st statistics. They want you to quote some statistics from the analysis, but they don't necessarily want you to look at the tables. I agree with it because there's a lot to take in on the science. And I think it's very important to learn statistical analysis when you need to learn it. Because a lot of these guys are not like me. I'm into statistics because I'm trying to move into data and analytics and visualization with Python, as I'm going to use that to get a, a better career in uh, a more lucrative career in data and business and use that money to pay for this uh, MSc. But... Um, the rest of these guys aren't like that. They're just here to learn some neuroscience. And if you force feed them a bunch of statistical analysis, every single module, they're going to really, really resent it. And they're really going to get bored with it. And also, I would argue that it's better to teach someone something when they're about to use it, see, and when they have to use it. So if you teach someone statistics, when they're actually trying to figure out what's going on with the data in front of them, they're more motivated to learn the statistics in the moment. And listen, that's from experience as well. When I used to learn st statistics at school, they used to teach it. It was terrible. They just used to be like, hey, this is an equation for standard deviation. This is an equation for this. And this is an equation for that. And I was just bored because it would have been nice if, and I look back now and say, it would have been nice if they took some real business case studies with a, almost every example and made it about that because now you're imagining something cool you're imagining you're a businessman and you want to work this out and these are the statistical tools you have available which ones would you use why would you use it well forget about telling you why you use this one but maybe in the textbook it would tell you you want to use this one because of this this and that and then you have a, an attachment to that particular statistical analysis and um you learn it a lot better that way. And now when I look at the dashboards that I'm creating and I start thinking about how to create new analytical tools for me to understand the 
example business I'm looking at, I find myself m imagining things, new ways of analysis that actually already exist. And I've already learned them a long time, well, the teacher tried to teach it to me a long time ago at, at school, but uh, I wasn't interested at the time. For example, standard deviation. I was the other day looking at the mean of a bunch of sales and I said, you know what, it would be cool if I could get a measure of how far on average each day is from the mean. That would be cool, wouldn't it? And I said, oh, isn't that what standard deviation is? That's why it's called that. Interesting. And that's when I got a deep understanding of it. So if you teach the students statistics right before they use them, like when they analyze statistics in the uh, uh, example research paper that they're creating, right? They're going to be a bit more driven. It's going to make the statistics a bit more interesting because they're trying to find information from these numbers based on the neuroscientific images um, that they have in their mind. So, I hope, well, I haven't answered your question because I don't know if they're going to teach it at that time. I think they will. I'm like 90% sure because they just have to. They just have to teach statistics at that level and in those last four modules. I don't know how well they'll teach it. I'm not really going to hypothesize because it, they might teach it really well, but they might not. You don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah. Now, next question. How well will this, how will this degree port end to career switches? How well will it allow you or how useful is it for a career switch? I'm not going to lie to you. The answer to this question isn't very positive. I personally took on this MSc because I'm a bit older. So I know what I'm doing. And even if I don't have an answer of what I'm going to do with this, I've got some years of experience and I have some kind of understanding of what I'm trying to get out of this. For me, I just want to learn about neuroscience, the brain and behavior. However, my career is not necessarily going to go down that path. I kind of want to use this to understand people, not individual people, but masses. Um, I want to understand drugs. I want to understand all those. Maybe one day I'll run a business relating to this, maybe. But for now, I'm not too sure. I did take it on in the moment because I wanted to specifically learn about behavior and drugs. Um, but we'll see where this takes me. Point is, I'm not specifically using this for a career switch, and I'll tell you why in a second. I don't like university jobs. I don't like public sector jobs. I think private sector jobs are the most important. To those people that don't know what pi private and public sector are, a private sector job is like uh, working for, say, uh, I don't know, McDonald's or Palantir or Deloitte. Any company that is owned, or even for a cafe, that's a private sector job. If you work for the government, that's a public sector job, meaning that the public of the nation are paying into taxation and that taxation is paying for this job here. Public sector jobs are not good. You can't really get any public sector jobs with a neuroscience degree or master's because, well, there's no real use for it there. Maybe with MI5 or CIA or whoever, I don't know, maybe one of those like secret agent based jobs, they might find a use for it. But generally, there won't be any public sector. Now, private sector is very, very limited as well. You may be able to move, get a job in a company like, say, Neuralink, which is Elon Musk's brain chip company, or one of its competitors. And there will be competitors who are researching right now. However, those jobs are extremely limited, so there's no real career switch there. This thing can probably get you into a good PhD program or into a research role. I don't know what, I don't know what you need for a research role. I think you may need a PhD already. But generally speaking, you're going to work in academia. However, there is another good use for the neuroscience masters or the applied 
psychology and MSc, sorry, psychology and neuroscience of mental health. If you learn Adobe Illustrator and Adobe After Effects as well, you can create visualizations, which I intended to do for my channel, but I have a lot of other things to deal with at the same time. You can create visualizations of neuroscience and create education like that, put that out there and create a following and all of that stuff. But that's, that's not really reasonable for some people. However, I know how to use Illustrator and I know how to use, I know how to use After Effects. I'm not like advanced with them, but I'll tell you they're a lot of fun. And if you can combine those with your neuroscience masters, it will be a good side project for your project and it will make the, your project and your side projects a lot more fun because you're not just copying tutorials. You'll do a little bit of that, but you're mostly going to be trying to draw things that you want to draw from your um, masters. And that, that ties in with what I said earlier. You're learning the Adobe skills. Which is, it's not very expensive either. It's only £30 a month uh, for students. You're developing those skills to be able to visualize something that you've been trying to visualize at university that you're interested in and the two interests align and you, you get good at both, I suppose. Um, I'm a very practical learner in that sense and I think that practical learning is probably the only good way to learn because you don't want to become one of those academics who just has an opinion on everything but no one really respects because you're not really, you're not really applied, are you? You're just an academic. There are some academics I like, like Richard Werner, for example, and David Nutt. Um, Richard Werner has had some real experiences in, in the real world, which is what makes him very, very good and very, very smart. He is an economist, by the way. And that is one. That is why he is very respected, and that's why he's very smart, in my viewpoint. Whereas when you look at an economics, you know, average economics academic, the hell do they know? They read about business in a book. They don't know anything about business. They're just going to... See, you can read and learn, but you must put yourself in a submissive position when you're reading and learning. You must understand that there are some parts of what you're reading that you can't have an opinion on because you don't know the background of the specific element. You might think it was a bad thing, but maybe it was a good thing. And you can't really go and start hypothesizing economic theories without real world experience because what happens a lot of the time a lot of the time is and, and I'm gonna link this to neuroscience in a second. What happens a lot of the time is that academics they just know, they just come up with theories like I know I had heard about this this academic guy who hypothesized that a two point five percent wealth tax would solve a lot of the problems for a lot of economies and he proposed that this wealth tax should be used to fund research and development which is directly linked to economic growth and the technology that comes out of that would be donated to smaller businesses and those smaller big businesses would grow and the reason why this is okay to do to big earners is because big earners use their wealth for unproductive purposes like rent. Now, the reason why this example is important here is because I want you to analyze this academic's viewpoint. He's used theories. He's jumped from one theory to one, another theory to another theory to another theory to another theory. When you actually go and do one of those things, like take 2.5% of everyone's wealth, well, it, it, I, th I believe his idea was for the richest, not just for, not for everyone. When you take 2.5% of everyone's wealth and stick it into research and just assume that research is linked to economic improvements, you it shows you have no real understanding of what research is. You're just saying the concept of research is linked to the concept of economic improvement the reason why that thinking is not very smart is because let's just say you're putting research into ai 
that specific type of research requires specific types or amounts of money and specific types of people. Those people have to be trained. The, the, the output of that is not necessarily going to help the economy in general. Yes, it's going to give you some great tech. But now, what are you saying? You're going to donate that to smaller businesses to be more optimal. This is all theory. Whereas when you look at Richard Werner, he will talk about his experiences and he'll be talking about banking and he'll be talking about taxation from a very, very unique perspective because he will also understand that if you tell rich people that we're taking 2.5% of your wealth, he also understands that those people have power and will be able to have the power to move their money somewhere else. Um, now, in the neurosciences, we only really have that kind of theoretical background because we have no real private sector. So you're always going to be that guy, that guy who's always going to be hypothesizing. So don't be that guy, firstly. Don't be that academic. Be an elite guy like Professor David Nutt or Professor Edmund T. Rolls, who are very, very smart academics. They're not, they're not, um, they're not like those are the other, the other not too smart guy I refer to. I actually don't. I've forgotten his name. The the one who I was saying that wasn't very smart. The the tax guy. Um, but there's that. When you do that, you're gonna have to accept that you're not really you. You can't analyze everything. Now I've gone on a bit of a tangent. To be perfectly honest, um, the answer to that question is, you can work in academia as a researcher or go and do a PhD for sure, right? Uh, and even as a researcher, you probably need a PhD first. But there's no real pro private sector jobs unless you want to go work for Neuralink in America. And even then, the, it would be extremely competitive to get in there because there's only really one company or you could go to one of the rivals. There aren't that many rivals. So overall, career switching is not, it's not really that good. However, I'll also say this, the fact that you've done a neuroscience master's in whatever field you're trying to get in or you're in, uh, if you're in business or whatever, this would be useful because it would show your ability to do a master's and to, to, to research into things and read data. So you can use it in other private sector jobs, just the neuroscience private sector is not developed enough yet to really allow you to get a very good career or a very high paid career. So I hope that's answered your questions. Um, remember to do all that standard stuff. Subscribe and share and all that good stuff. And remember to check out neuroscienceafterdark.com. Done.